Hi, my name is Richard Bilderbeek and this talk is called Open Science and Humans Being Scientists. You can find this presentation online here. The, co the copyright is public domain because I care more about open science than I care about public glory being attributed to my name. This talk I give at Open Science Uppsala, which is the Uppsala local community on open science. And this is uh, my practice talk. So this title is a pun on an earlier talk I gave there. This talk is about regular humans, citizens, helping scientists out and doing scientific data collection or whatever. So it's called about it's about citizen science, where the earlier talk was about scientific misconduct. It was called open science and scientists being humans the other way around. Which was the one but best visited talk ever at Open Science Uppsala. So I thought let's reuse that title. So to get a bit talking about citizen science I'm going to show you some projects. Uh, first to get you a bit of an idea what's it about and you'll see then I'll go into the details and answer the question if it's worth it. So one of the biggest citizen science projects, or the most successful one, or very exemplary one, is the eBird project. Uh, it's a website. Uh, some people, they look at birds, they go outside and they, they see a bird. And then they um, share, if they see a bird, especially if it's a rare bird. And they like sharing this, so all the birders um, can join them or come there and, and, and then watch that rare bird. So if you find a rare bird, you can go to the eBird website, you click on submit and then you submit that you've seen a bird at a certain spot. And then uh, it's noted and then people will look into it. So this project has about 25 million observations per month. And that amount of data is reviewed by 500 volunteer experts. Um, and you can imagine that we need somebody to assure the quality of the data because if I see some rare bird and I'm a well I'm not very good at birding then probably I've been wrong probably I've seen a very common bird um, so so the, the, the experts they help out to uh, make sure the data is of right quality and I've seen this project in action I've seen uh, a birder I'm from biology and uh, that had his pager go off and that there was a sighting of an albatross somewhere in the Netherlands and um, he went to this website, uh, checked it uh, and would go there immediately within one hour like he was looking up who to go to, who to go with and who to drive and in which group and then they went to go watch that bird thanks to the eBird project Alright, and you can imagine 25 million observations a month even, you cannot do this on your own if you want such a big data set. So that it uses citizens, it uses amateurs, um, and it's quite big. Like and I wanna, Now I want to go to some completely different project, that's why I picked this. This is a project called Maturity of Baby Sounds, um, in which you have baby sounds, of uh, five seconds long, fra small fragments. This is to maintain the privacy of the baby, but also people are in the background. And then of these sounds, you must classify uh, if it's what age the baby is or the person is, uh, if it's a person talking at all, uh, or if it's junk, um, and what kind of emotion you think the baby has when you hear a sound of a baby. And there are now 20,000 volunteers that have worked on this and there have been one and a half million classifications. In this project you can find it on Zooniverse. Um, I can copy the link already here. Let's take a look. And then we see the... the so it's still in progress. Uh, welcome back it says. We need your help to classify some audio clips. And we can see the progress here. So now it's already 19,000 volunteers, half million, one and a half million. Um, yeah, here's the scientist. Here's what it's about. Uh, well, things, 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 things. 
So that's another citizen science project where they ask volunteers to help out. Well, Zooniverse is the biggest website for this as far as I know at this moment. So Zooniverse, now I just click on it, uh, is the, the biggest place where you can do citizen science. So if you scroll down, so that's a lot of classifications in this year. This is a lot of volunteers. Um, so it's a quite uh, quite powerful website to be on. So I, I click on projects here to take a look at what kind of projects we have. So these are the, I don't know why these four projects at the top here, um, but maybe I don't know why. But here we can search for all the projects. Uh, so this is the monsoon voyages in which history is written down from ships. Um, exo asteroid that well there are a lot of reading emotions synapse safari um, and yet they are classified also in different categories like arts it's about reading emotions uh, biology has uh, tagging trees this is one of my favorite projects where you have to tag which trees are in an are in an image yeah so they want to so they have AI to scan satellite images of forests, uh, but that is not perfect data. It's an AI that so makes mistakes and they want to improve its training and they want you to click on trees. Uh, yep, and so uh, they're not very far yet. Well, 0% complete, I'm not sure if that's correct. But, uh, yep, that's a uh, tag trees. So all these things are part of the Zooniverse, um, and you can of course put your project there or uh, work on other people's projects. And it goes very broad, like history. They have like some people like writing down, like putting in digital format what people have written down. Here we have the maturity of baby sounds, that's for language, literature, reading emotions, um, so that AIs can read emotions better. Um, dental disease detection, so there's a lot of things that these projects, they ask humans to help out and to, to train an AI on, that, uh, or, or to work together with an AI. So it helps you get this big data set that AI typically needs. Um, yeah, all right, so that's the Zooniverse. Let's go back to my presentation. So the Zooniverse has a lot of projects and then you can wonder, all right, what comes out of those things? So I've just taken uh, one example that came out of it and that could only have been done by citizen science. And this is the question, what is the number sense in humans? So humans have a sense of numbers when is it at its best? Are we best with numbers when we're when we're young, let's say 10 years old, or does it only increase with time, or is there an optimum? When are we best at sensing numbers? So to do this, they did an ANS dot test, I don't know what ANS means, but the question is, uh, for example, A is, is, is one ANS dot test, are there more yellow or blue dots? in this image um, and then b is another uh, no, no, these are like two questions you have like 300 trials in eight minutes so that goes quite fast uh, you have to be quick there and there are about 10,000 people having responded to this question to find out when is number sense in humans the best well, they had a response, them like it f these dots they flash up for a short time, and I have to pick um, if it was yellow or blue that was more abundant. Um, and then a, s a simple finding is well, when you're young, like at around 15, your response time is quickest, but that's just response time, that's not number sensing. So you have an idea uh, at age 15. But the, the, of course, the precision is more interesting, like when are we most accurate in saying this? And I'll show you a graph that looks like this. Uh, and here we have age over the years and a Weber fraction at the vertical. And Weber fraction means 
uh, noise in this case. So the amount of noise we do in our predictions, the more the how much r incorrect we are, and this peaks at around uh, 30 according to the author of that paper. All right. So they've used 10,000 people to get this graph. You could not have done this on your own for that budget, I guess. All right. So this is a. So that was a, a, an example of a successful citizen science project, but I think eBird is also quite successful. Uh, but eBird may not... Uh, um, I didn't show any articles based on eBird. So the, this talk's research questions was like a, like like one of the questions I always have is, is it worth it? Um, those are research questions two and three. How important is it? Is it worth it? And why is UNESCO interested in it like 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 what do they add to this well, can they do they have an answer on that question or is it just me that needs to find out how important it is but we need to talk about open science too so first I'll be answering what's the relationship between citizen science and open science and for that I'm going to show you some definitions and I'll show you the relationship um, and then we move on so for when we talk about open science, most of our speakers go to this website and they show they show this figure. And you can't read this in the back, uh, but it's about open access, open data, open source software, open hardware, open a lot of things with open in it. And in the bottom, this orange part, it says open engagement of societal actors. I'm going to zoom in on that. Bam. And there, are one of the four things are citizen and participatory science all right so citizen science is part of the open science definition and this brings me to so let's let's dive into those definitions open science and this is again the unesco definition that we've probably already seen multiple times and let's go back to the slide open science is a set of principles and practice oh, all right so you can't do that sure 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 Open science is a set of principles and practices that aim to make scientific research from all fields accessible to everyone for the benefits of scientists and society as a whole. Open science is about making sure not only that scientific knowledge is accessible, but also that, start of boldface, the production of that knowledge itself is inclusive, equitable and sustainable. Well, so I made it myself bold, bold, where's the relationship to citizen science? Um, what is citizen science? They say citizen science is research conducted with participation from the general public or amateur slash non-professional researchers or participants for science, social science and many other disciplines. Uh, synonyms are citizen science, crowd science, crowdsourced science, civic science, participatory monitoring, or volunteer monitoring. Alright, so with these two definitions out of the way, what is the relationship between the two? Um, well, first give some features. I just took uh, the features from a list. Um, what is unique by definition is it can obtain data that is otherwise impossible to get. So by definition that's unique, uh, because well it's the only thing that can obtain it. Um, because well you can have a lot of volunteers and they those are free, as in as in beer, not in uh, speech. However, we know that managing volunteers takes time. It's uh, it's one of the major hurdles when you want to do citizen science. And the goal of among of, of it is to engage the public in doing science. Th there's this idea that they then bond with science uh, and the scientific method. It is however difficult to guarantee the quality of the data. So you just sending out citizens to collect data, that's not a good idea, that won't work. You need some way to safeguard the quality of your data. For example, what eBird does, the, the, the birding website, is they have expert volunteers review the submitted data. 
Um, also, they keep track of how much submissions you have done, so they can if you so they can they, they keep track of your experience level. And if you're very experienced and you spot a rare bird, it will uh, maybe directly go live uh, on the website. Also, if you use citizen science, it's harder to pass peer review uh, among others because it's hard to guarantee the quality of the data. So the relationship between citizen science and open science is, I think, that all citizen science is part of open science when it produces open data. So you already see here two, 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 two notes. Well, for one, I'll give you data on the next slide. That's not always the case that it produces open data. Um, but it should probably also be published in the Open Access Journal. But on that, I don't have data, so I won't show you. But here, for example, here we this is a paper that checked if if you've done citizen science, where is the data uh, published? How open is the data? And we see in 0.6% that the data is closed. So that means you can uh, not everyone can use it. Uh, we know that the volunteers that do it don't expect this either. They expect it to always be open. Uh, only 40% of the volunteers would agree with this, compared to 96% uh, except uh, agreeing with open. But the biggest data, uh, the biggest type of data is unclear. So a lot of citizen science projects don't have a clear label if they're open or closed. Um, so we don't we, we, we don't know if this is open or closed. Uh, and they've checked at quite some citizen science projects. So that's the bulk. So now we know a bit what it is, how important is it? And I'll show you some qualitative indicators here. Um, for example, we can help researchers to address previously unsolved problems, unsolvable problems, like watching a lot of birds and where they are. Uh, but also important that they can educate and engage people in science and the scientific method. And that's important for it's some type of, like it overlaps with outreach. So I'm, I'm not that interested in these things. I'm going to take some look at some quantitative indicators and I'll be looking at the financial impact it has, about uh, engagement, um, the scholarly impact it has, uh, citizen science has on the academic world and the success rate of citizen science projects. Uh, for that I'll be using some back of the envelope calculations. I will supply data for everything. Uh, but you can we can discuss a bit if it should be a factor two more or less. But I think it gives you an idea about the order of magnitude. The goal is to find out if open science, uh, if using citizen science is worth it. Um, and I spoiler alert, I think it's worth it. And I'll show you, uh, and I'll walk you through it to try to that you can at least understand my reasoning. All right. Qualitative indicators financial. Take a look at the financial impact of citizen science. So here there is uh, there are two sources. Uh, apparently, there are two sources here, and they've looked at citizen science projects, and they've looked at the value of the data set. So they estimated the amount of hours the volunteers put in, and they use I think twenty five dollars an hour as a rate. Um, and then we see that one source has one and a half million dollar being created, that's the value of the data set, and the other uses two and a half billion United States dollar being created by these 388 projects together. So that's two and a half billion dollar added by volunteers. So just for the rest of my calculation, I assume that the value is two and a half billion because well there are probably more than the, that paper looked at um, so I'm going to use two and a half billion but then the question is is that a is that a little or is that a lot like two and a half billion it sounds like a lot but how do we compare this to for example the global science budget we are spending or how do we compare this to to a scientist 
So I would say it's worth it if the value of the data I create is worth as much as my salary. Because if I would spend all my, it's like, if all my salary, it's like my salary is invested in creating that data instead of in me. Um, although both things were done. So this is my my threshold I use. Let's take a look. Um, here we see the science budget spending of the EU, USA and the world. This is in billions of dollars. Citizen science adds two and a half billion dollars. That's here. And we see that this two and a half billion dollars is less than one percent of the EU spending on science. Less than a third of a percent of the USA, and about 0.15 percent what's spent in the world as a whole. So you could argue that citizen science adds 0.15 percent extra value to the scientific community. I would say that that's not that's not very much. Still, hold on. I'll I'll, I'll show some different numbers later. So let's take a look at the engagement. So if the goal is to, to reach the general audience, to educate them in the scientific method, or to make them bond with the scientific management, uh, scientists with science, um, around this amount of people, one to two million people are volunteering annually. Uh, this is 2015, that's 10 years old. Let's assume it's the same and still at 2.28 million people. Then the question is, is that a little or a lot? Um, and compare this to the number of scientists. So I would say, for me, the rule is when is it worth, when I'd scale up, I expect to reach 100 citizens for it to feel worth it. This is my uh, threshold uh, when I think it's worth it. Well, we can estimate how many people are reached. We know that in 2014 there were around 2 million si citizen, uh, citizens. Uh, we know in uh, four years later that there were this many scientists' density, so this many per million globally. The world population was this big. And that means that in 2018 we had 10.51 million scientists. Well, sure, there's four years in between, but assuming these are more or less the same values. Um, over the years, not too much has changed. There is one citizen per one dot six per four dot six scientists. Um, so you need multiple scientists to get one citizen out. We also know that citizen science is not u is used in few publications. So taking a look at this graph, um, we see the the the, 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 the the colored lines are the percentage of publications in, uh, expressed in proportions. So let's use this value 0.0015. Uh, this is a proportion. The percentage is 0.15%. So that's about a sixth of a percent of publications are citizen science projects. So it's not used that often. Uh, and the question is, so let's say you have a citizen science project. How often does it result in a peer-reviewed paper? And we know that this is 12%. Um, maybe it's hard to pass, to, to pass peer review, or maybe the linking is sloppy, that it doesn't always link nicely back to the paper. But then this 12%, is that a lot? Let's say I do a project in my lab or uh, in my research, what's the chance that it's, it can be linked to a peer-reviewed paper? What's the chance that I will actually get one and link to it? Well, I, we, we know this. There's a study on this. We know from uh, open access papers, uh, open access projects, that around 61% of those projects can be linked to a publication. Open access projects are those on, for example, the Open Web of Science, what's it called again? OSC, Science, Open Science, OSC, yeah, on the o Open Science Community. Those websites, 61% uh, you get something out of it. 
If it's closed access, then 21%. Um, but this is more than citizen science. It's a bit of a more more of a gamble for, but not too much of like a factor two of a gamble. My question then is, all right, so now we have put this citizen science a bit into perspective. Then I thought, all right, this is this doesn't look too too good. Why would UNESCO be interested in this? So what I did, I searched the UNESCO website why citizen science is important. Um, although the numbers I've shown so far uh, were not very impressive. Uh, so I searched the website for numbers. The result, I found no numbers. It was just general talk, like qualitative talk. So instead, I took initiative in my hand and I started revisiting the numbers because I think I've made a calculation error. So we did know what the world spent on science but only 0.15% of the publications are citizen science papers so let's assume 0.15% of scientists is a citizen scientist. Hence around two and a half billion dollar of global science funding goes to these citizen scientists. Sure, there are assumptions that's only one citizen science per publication and they don't overlap. Um, but it gives you an idea of the order of magnitude. The data set created by citizen science project is two and a half billion. Um, so for me, the the reasoning was all right if if it's more than my salary well we know science funding um, that only a percentage of it reads reaches my salary I don't know how much but let's assume 50% uh, let's assume 80% reaches my salary in that case my salary is indeed less than the data set being created so I would say yes it's worth it financially also, if we take a look at engagement, we can do the same trick. So we found out that globally we reach one citizen per 4.6 scientists. However, this engagement is done by only 0.15% of those scientists. Uh, and then you multiply these numbers and you get that one citizen scientist reaches 307 citizens. And my threshold was 100. So yes, this uh, this is worth it in my opinion. So and I think these two numbers like they co they convince me way more than UNESCO with its general talk. All right, let's draw some conclusions. What we've discussed already: what's the relationship between citizen science and open science? Is that citizen science is part of open science if it produces open data, and probably also in an open access journal. How important is citizen science? Well, it is used in few publications. It results in less papers per project, but its financial impact per citizen science is big because of the data set being created is more than his or her salary. And the engagement per scientist is big, like a, s a citizen scientist reaches around 300 uh, people. So that I would say that's big. My threshold would be a hundred, but it is around three hundred. Why UNESCO is interested is one big gamble for me. I can only guess if it's money, engagement, inclusiveness, but no, I'm not convinced by any of their arguments. Um, and that, though, from those conclusions, there are some things we can discuss. For example, I feel citizen science is worth it because I determined. Uh, my my conditions for me f to f to feel that it's worth it, uh, but maybe you have different numbers. I'm not sure if you would agree. Um, but I hope at least my talk made sense that you understand how I made that decision, and I wonder which kind of if statements you use for your own determination if it's worth it. One strong weakness of this talk is that 
the the literature 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 search I've done is quite shallow. I'm not into citizen science at all. Um, I'm not an academic that researches open science. Uh, I spend around ten hours on this in my free time, and um, I don't know how strong of an effect that has. All right. For example, there's this book. The Science of Citizen Science. Um, I